American West welcomed many waves of settlers from the mid-19th century until the dawn of the 20th century. Those who headed for the Oregon Territory in the 1840s and 1850s sought freedom and the one square mile of land the government gave them as a reward for settling this untamed land far from the civilized cities of the East. Other settlers headed to the mountains of California and Colorado to seek their fortunes in gold fields. Later, the Great Plains filled with immigrants who began to farm these vast treeless spaces, which up until then had been called the Great American Desert. In the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, the federal government believed in Thomas Jefferson's vision of America as a nation of family farmers, decent, hard-working, God-fearing people who could live self-sufficiently on their own small pieces of land. And as a result of new government policies, land which had been set aside for the Indians was taken back from them, and the Indians were sent to live on reservations. Next, the railroad was built straight across their wide, unfenced lands, lands where these native peoples had hunted buffalo for countless generations. The Indians fought back against these brutal policies, but in the end they lost their ancestral lands. And settlers began to head west to claim land which had never been touched by a plow before. The government encouraged settlement by passing the Homestead Act of 1862. This law provided 160 acres of free land to anyone who would live on it and farm it for five years. And between 1862 and 1900, around a half million people took the government up on its offer. Although these were very dark days for the Indians, many people, including ex-slaves and extremely poor European peasants, were given a chance at becoming independent farmers, a life they had only dreamed of but had never hoped to achieve. Let us discover some of the joys and hardships of the homesteader's life on the early American frontier and learn how these farming families met the challenge of the untamed land. It is hard to imagine what it must have felt like to arrive at last after a long journey, having sold most of what you owned, to look out over an unfamiliar landscape, knowing this would be where your family would undoubtedly live for generations to come. To know you would have to rely on the earth, the weather, willpower, and the luck to survive. Work had to begin immediately. The first thing to do would be to get a roof over your head. So if you had trees on your land, you would build a log cabin. But on the great desolate plains of western Nebraska and Kansas, trees were few and far between, so you would build your house of sod, brick-shaped clumps of prairie dirt and grass. From these crude materials, houses, sometimes even fancy ones, were constructed. Long ago, a visitor to a sod house described a conversation with her hostess in which she said, Something similar to a fine hail is descending on my face and hands. And her hostess replied, Go back to sleep. It's only the wind redistributing the building. Such was life inside a sod house. Having provided shelter, the next concern was to find a reliable source of water. And on the arid high plains, this could be a real problem. As one settler put it, I reckon there ain't no freedom here except to die of thirst. Wells were sometimes dug by hand 25 feet deep, only to strike solid rock and come up dry. Then the frontier farmer had to begin his search all over again. In later times, Wells could be mechanically drilled, and the most reliable source of energy on the plains, wind, was used to pump the water. By the 1880s, windmills could be found everywhere, and they became a symbol of the victory of the homesteader over the harshness of the prairie. Once the pioneer family had acquired water and shelter, the real business of homesteading, farming, could begin. One young Nebraska settler described the unfamiliar landscape to his mother in the east. 
Ma, you can see as far as you please here, and almost every foot inside can be plowed. Farming began by plowing the land so that it could be planted with seed. Early farmers on the plains were named sod busters after the plows they used. These plows could turn over an unbroken strip of ground 12 to 18 inches wide and several inches deep, making a sound like a heavy piece of fabric being torn in half as they cut through the earth. Horses, or oxen, were used to pull the plow, and plowing up 160 acres was no easy job. After the soil was plowed, it had to be harrowed. By harrowing the plowed fields, big clods of earth were broken up and the surface was leveled for planting. The earliest settlers on the plains planted corn because American wheat could not stand up to the temperature extremes and periodic drought of this region. One Nebraska newspaper listed 33 ways to prepare meals using corn. The writer reported, I live entirely on food made of corn. But in 1874, Russian immigrants introduced a new strain of wheat, turning the Great Plains into the most productive grain farming land on earth. Wheat crops were planted in the fall by casting the seed upon the tilled ground, and corn was planted in the spring. Throughout the growing season, the crops had to be kept free of weeds, and before the days of machinery, cultivation was done by hand with a hoe. Farm animals provided fertilizer for the soil, and crops were rotated each year to give the soil a chance to replenish itself. Most homesteaders relied on rain to water their crops, and when the rain didn't come, it meant disaster to the farmers. In good years, Midsummer was time to harvest the wheat as it turned from green to gold under the intense heat of July and August. Harvesting by hand was hot, sweaty work as the farmers bent over the grain, slashing it with a scythe. The cut grain was then bundled into sheaves. Once the sheaves were collected, the laborious process of flailing freed the grain from the stalks. Because farmers got paid for their crops only once a year, they had to be very careful how they spent their money. Most farmers were very thrifty and used money sparingly to buy those items that they couldn't make themselves, such as tools and medicine. They produced almost everything else they needed to survive. Every farm had cows for meat, milk, and butter. A certain amount of pasture land was set aside for these animals to graze and these pastures had to be fenced to keep the animals from eating the growing crops. Before the prairies were enclosed with barbed wire, fences made of long strips of wood called split rail fences were used to protect the crops from hungry beasts. Because the grass didn't grow in the pastures during the long cold winters, the farmers also had to grow grass to provide hay for their animals to eat. On the early frontier, Hay, like grain, had to be cut and stacked by hand using pitchforks. The hay was stored in the hayloft of the barn to protect it from rain, which would cause it to rot. Most of the corn which had been planted in the spring was used to feed the animals. Corn was harvested late in the fall when it was completely dry. Harvesting by hand one ear at a time was slow, back-breaking work. After the corn was collected, it could be stored in corn cribs for use throughout the winter. Pigs were kept on most farms for meat, pork, ham, and bacon. The pigs lived in their own muddy little pigsties and were fed on corn and household slops. Hens, geese, and ducks were also kept for both fresh eggs and meat. Oftentimes, the poultry were left to wander freely about the farm, and children had to search to find the eggs. Sheep were raised for wool, which could be spun into thread, which could then be woven on a loom into woolen cloth. Frontier women took care of the house and did the spinning and weaving. 
They were also in charge of the family garden where vegetables were raised. In the summer, the gardens produced abundant salads, fresh beans, peas, squash, and other vegetables. But these gardens, like grain fields themselves, could sometimes be destroyed by insects, especially grasshoppers. In 1874, the editor of the Wichita Eagle reported, they came in untold millions in clouds upon clouds until their fluttering wings looked like a sweeping snowstorm in the heavens, until their dark bodies covered everything green upon the earth. A variety of methods were used to make sure some vegetables, as well as fruit from the small orchards, lasted throughout the year. In the days before refrigeration, food spoiled quickly, so vegetables had to be preserved in glass jars, dried into strips like these pumpkins, or just stored in a cool underground root cellar. Feeding a big farm family was a lot of work. In the early days, cooking was done in an open fireplace which also heated the house. If wood was available, it was used for fuel and wood chopping took up a good deal of time in the winter months. In the absence of wood, dried cow manure, corn, or sunflower stalks were burned. Even the ashes from the fire found a use, enriching the soil of the garden. In later days on the frontier, cast iron cooking ranges made the housewife's task easier. Because the pioneer house was without plumbing, Water had to be carried from the well, or creek, to be used for cooking and washing. Washing clothes by hand was tedious work, and frontier women even had to make their own soap. Soap making was a messy business, as it involved boiling hog lard or other animal fats with a strong chemical called lye. This same laundry soap was also used for scrubbing grimy bodies during the weekly ritual of the bath. Frontier families were large because the family provided all the labor for the farm. And on the farm, the work never seemed to end. In spite of these heavy demands, most farms were happy places where children could experience the freedom of the wide open spaces and the companionship of animals. And the family could take real pride in their accomplishments. Children and babies meant work for mothers. And childbirth was dangerous to both the mother and baby. It was not unusual for death to accompany the birth process. In the days before inoculations, many children died of smallpox, measles, and influenza. Most doctoring was done by mothers who relied on family medical books to find cures for every ailment. As the years passed and the frontier became more civilized, the small sod houses and log cabins were replaced by more substantial dwellings of lumber and brick. And these houses began to fill up with furnishings bought mail order from big eastern manufacturers. Many happy winter hours were spent on the farm, poring over the well-thumbed pages of the Sears and Roba catalog. You could buy almost anything from one of these catalogs, from the latest fashions, to furniture, toys, medical supplies, and farm equipment. You just filled out the order form, sent your money in, and six weeks later your merchandise was delivered to the nearest post office or railway station. By the final decade of the 19th century, mechanization had revolutionized farming. Mechanization had begun in the 1870s with the introduction of steam tractors, which could pull mechanical plows, seed planters, harrows, cultivators, and reapers. The steam thresher proved to be truly revolutionary. It saved immense amounts of time, instantly spewing out bushels of golden grain. For a time, it seemed the earth would yield its rich bounty of grain forever. 
more and more land was brought under cultivation as new machinery made it possible to farm huge areas of land. But 60 years after the first settlers constructed their sod houses, disaster struck. At this time, in the early 1930s, the rain stopped falling on the Great Plains, and the powerful winds, which always blew across the plains, picked up the rich topsoil and carried it off in clouds which blotted out the sun. Many farmers, who were themselves the children or grandchildren of the first sodbusters, had to pack up their belongings and abandon their farms. The wheat they had planted with such exuberance did not adequately protect the soil from the erosive forces of the wind and overgrazing of the native grasslands had worsened the problem. The drought on the plains lasted for seven years. The first big dust storm struck in May of 1934. As a result of this single storm, 350 million tons of dirt were blown all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. The federal government, which was already staggering under the weight of the worst depression in America's history, stepped in to aid the victims and established the Soil Conservation Service. Farmers were resettled and taught new techniques to prevent wind erosion. But throughout the 1930s, thousands of defeated farmers rolled west in their beat-up pickup trucks, hoping for whatever work they could find. These caravans were like the earliest wagon trains in reverse and were clouded with desperation, not happiness. The utter hopelessness shows on the face of this woman whose husband has just sold the tires off their car to buy food for her family. Eventually, the rains returned and with new farming techniques, the Great Plains have not witnessed such destruction again. Now prosperous farms dot the landscape, reminding us of the men, women, and children who settled these lands in the hope of beginning new lives, and of the greatly outnumbered Indian tribes who lost their ancestral lands to these homesteaders so long ago.